committee also decided to double the pace of reductions in its asset purchases. Beginning in mid-January, we are phasing out our purchases more rapidly because with elevated inflation pressures, inflation is running well above target and growth is well above potential. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. The Fed signals inflation as public enemy number one, laying out a roadmap for faster rate hikes. Global stocks surge. Super Thursday, the Bank of England and ECB are two in a flood of central banks reporting today. The two inspectors of inflation and Omicron loom large. And stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition this hour. We have a top lineup of guests. Later on, we speak to BlackRock's Elga Barch and the former Fed governor, Randy Krosner, as well as the General Chief Executive, Philippe Dunet. You can send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. First thing is first, though, and let's check in on the markets on the back of what we heard from the Fed. It was interesting. Our uh, new queen of charts, actually, just crowned. Valerie was sending us some 210 spreads, looking at yields, so that steepening yield curve, actually telling us that maybe the market is taking it as a of our stance. And I have to say, if you look at equity markets, a lot of, uh, I guess, what we heard from Jay Powell was priced in. But also, he was very careful in his choice of words in saying, yes, we will start to tighten and normalize policy, but actually we'll do so very carefully because we don't want to hurt the economy. And that's really some equities flying. You can see the European stock 600 gaining 1.3 percent, technology one of the biggest gainers, and then the U.S. dollar at 1.1. 182. Uh, it's interesting to also look at dollar, for example, compared to euro dollar, one of the interesting things. The German bond, look, there's a couple of things going on with Germany. Uh, that government selling 410 billion euros in debt in 2022. I don't know whether that will have a huge implication also on their thinking of where they spend it, but certainly we're on Germany watch with that 10 year bond yield because it's only been a week and a half that we have a new government in charge. So we also try and understand what they're thinking in terms of debt issuance and debt sale. Right. Right, let's look at the European map, a couple of things that we need to watch out for. So, of course, it is a Bank of England day. It'll be really interesting to see whether um, they do something with rates. That would be a surprise to some people in the markets, but we've also seen a repricing of that possibility after that CPI print. Also in the UK, Boohoo, one of the biggest losers. This is a retail company. They sell clothes and they're saying uh, because we don't buy uh, sweatshirts that typically we keep and don't return, but we're now starting to try a party clothes and the returns are higher and that's expensive for them. And you can see the DAX gaining some 1.7%. Also, another central bank that we need to watch out for is the Turkish Central Bank with the lira in free fall and the Norges Bank policy rate uh, coming out, I think, just moments ago, saying that they will most likely be raised in March. So we have central banks dealing with the same problems, but you can see the signaling the messaging is extremely different given their individual economies. So Jay Powell signaling inflation is now public enemy number one. The Fed governor has announced a faster pace of tapering and he also laid out the roadmap for rate hikes. Now, the Bank of England and the ECB also announced their decisions today. Let's get the key takeaways from the Fed and what to watch out for from the BOE and the ECB today. Joining us, our markets editor, Christina Kino, our UK economy reporter, Lizzie Burden, and our ECB reporter, Yana Randall. Christine, let's start with you. If you look at the big rally in stocks across the world, we're also seeing a steepening yield curve. What does it tell us about how investors think it went yesterday? Well, Francine, I think this is probably as close to a bit of a Goldilocks situation as we could get for stocks, definitely. I think when you look just at the market reaction, it's very interesting because if you're looking just at the market reaction, you would have concluded that it was a dovish message from the Fed yesterday, despite the fact that they indicated a faster pace of tapering and more rate hikes than markets were pricing. I think there's a little bit of expectations going on here when it comes to the Fed in terms of uh, investors might be seeing seeing faster rate hikes and faster tapering as, a, as an indication that the Fed might do less moving forward. So beyond the 2022 sort of time horizon, I think there's some expectations getting built into markets that perhaps after the Fed goes with its three um, tightening um, rate hikes that it indicated, it might not do much more than that and therefore won't do much harm to longer term growth prospects. And that's probably what we're seeing supporting stocks this morning. Uh, thank you, Christine. Lizzie, inflation, a big issue for the Bank of England, but also a difficult virus situation with Omicron. 
Yeah, it's been a constant back and forth over the past six weeks. After the November decision, it seemed like all the Bank of England needed to convince it to raise rates in December was strong jobs data. But then you had Omicron and the new restrictions. And even the most hawkish member of the Monetary Policy Committee, Michael Saunders, said that he wanted clearer data on the new variant before voting to raise rates. And then, just when we thought that a December rate hike was off the table, along came the CPI print, 5.1% in November, the highest in more than a decade. So Bloomberg Economics says now we can't rule out a rate rise today and it would be the, a historic moment, the first rate rise in the pandemic. Yana, a possible end to the ECB's PEP program is today. What are we watching out for? Certainly the ECB is expected to announce that PEP purchases will come to an end in March, as expected and as planned. The more interesting um, decision is what will happen to the regular purchase program to the APP. Economists, of course, expect a temporary boost to that program when PEP expires. Um, and the ECB might also grant itself a little bit more flexibility uh, when it comes to how it reinvests those bonds that it bought under the PEP. Um, as for interest rates, uh, the ECB has made very clear that they are a very long way off. Uh, they have a quite different view on inflation than uh, Jay Powell at the Fed. Um, they have not ret retired uh, entirely uh, the assessment that inflation is in fact transitory. They've said it might take a, lot, uh, a little longer than expected for price pressures to come down. But a new forecast that we will um, get this afternoon will in fact show that inflation will be back below the 2% goal after next year. Uh, thank you so much to all of you, of course, looking at some of the great decisions that we've had, some of the important ones. Also, Norges Bank, we mentioned it very quickly, uh, but Norges Bank just hiked to uh, five, well, 0 0.5%. So look out for Norges Bank. Then we had the SNB still talking about this higher franc, but not doing anything on rates. Our Christina Kino, our Lizzie Burden, and our Yana Randa. Now, we'll have plenty more, of course, on central banks uh, throughout the day. Smart conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. This hour, we have a top lineup of guests. Later on, we speak to BlackRock's Elga Barge, former Fed Governor Randy Krosner, and the General Chief Executive Philippe Duny. Send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm from Sinakwa here in London. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Good morning, Francine. European benchmark power prices have surged to a record after EDF was forced to close or extend the halts of four French reactors for safety reasons. German electricity for next year jumped as much as 7% after a safety regulator told the French company, the world's biggest nuclear plant operator, to replace a faulty pipes. The extended shutdowns come just as European temperatures are poised to get colder next week. Now, the UK is warning about the spread of Omicron after hitting a record 78,000 total new COVID cases on Wednesday. The government says it's expecting a surge of infections which will feed through into hospitalizations. There will be an increasing number of Omicron patients going into the NHS, going into hospital, going into intensive cares uh, and the exact ratios we don't yet know but that there will be substantial numbers and that that will begin to become apparent in my view. Uh, fairly soon after Christmas. It'll start before then, but in terms of the big numbers, uh, I think that's a reasonably, uh, I'm afraid, a reasonably uh, nailed on prospect. Estonia's Prime Minister says the EU shouldn't wait for Russia to make a move on Ukraine and must be united in sending a strong message of deterrence. Kayla Callas spoke to Bloomberg as EU leaders met in Brussels for a two-day summit. The question is, of course, what everybody has. Are they bluffing or, or are they really planning, uh, planning a move? But, uh, but in any case, I think we, we shouldn't wait for the move, but uh, send a clear signal of deterrence that, that don't think about this uh, because we will react. 
And Germany is rationing COVID-19 vaccines through the rest of the year amid a surprise shortage of shots. The country's new health minister, Karl Lauterbach, says it has about 3 million doses of the BioNTech vaccine and 10 million Moderna shots. He says Germany is seeking to buy unused doses from Eastern European countries. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. Powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 100 and 20 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, Smart Conversations continue on Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. This hour, we have a top lineup of guests. Later on, we speak to BlackRock's Alga Barch, the former Fed governor, Randy Krosner, and Generali Chief Executive, Philippe Donnet. Send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Supply and demand imbalances related to the pandemic and the reopening of the economy have continued to contribute to elevated levels of inflation. These problems have been larger and longer lasting than anticipated. We are phasing out our purchases more rapidly because with elevated inflation pressures and a rapidly strengthening labor market, the economy no longer needs increasing amounts of policy support. The economy is so much stronger. I was here at the Fed when we lifted off the last time and the economy is so much stronger now, it's so much closer to full employment. There's a provision, uh, it, it w used to be called the balanced approach provision. It is a, a, a provision that would enable us to, in this case, because of high inflation, move before achieving maximum employment. Well, that was Jay Powell banging the drums for a strong use economy and laying out the roadmap for rate hikes, announcing a quicker pace of tapering and branding inflation public enemy number one. Well, joining us now is Anne Katrine Patterson, Alliance of Global Investors Investment Strategist, and Randy Krosner, former Fed Governor and University of Chicago Professor of Economics. So thank you both for joining us. Randy, you've lived this. I mean, you were at the Fed <laughs> where you had, you know, decisions, but also once you take a decision is how you communicate it with this tricky thing called the markets. What was your main takeaway from what Jay Powell said yesterday? Well, clearly the markets took it well. I think uh, it had been telegraphed that uh, they were making a pivot. Because remember, it wasn't that long ago that we we're saying, well, maybe we're not going to be raising rates until maybe once next year and uh, not uh, until 2023. Now, three next year, more rapid uh, taper, and uh, the markets took it well. And I think the reason they did is they know that the Fed better get moving because otherwise inflation would get out of control. Yeah, and Katrina, I mean, the market seemed to be pretty supportive. Is it that a lot of this was priced in already? Or is it that really the, the Fed communicated the fact that, yes, they're normalizing, but the economy takes precedence? Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? I think that um, the market is breathing a sigh of relief that the FOMC meeting suggested that it is taking inflation risks in the United States more seriously right now. But looking forward, I believe the question um, really will be whether the Fed will dare to de de do even more in order to tackle the inflation risk in the in the U.S. economic um, system and whether they will be willing in, uh, to surpass the terminal rate, which so far um, they they are not planning according to the dot plot. And um, in this case, um, um, markets could be taken um, by surprise. But for the time being, it's rather a sigh of relief um, that they are taking inflation risks seriously. Um, Randy, what was going to be the most difficult thing for the Fed to, to do if the market starts pricing in inflation stays elevated and the market you know, starts pricing in more aggressive measures in terms of rate hikes, how will they handle it? I think this is this is the delicate balance, the tightrope that they walk, because they want to make sure that inflation expectations don't get out of control, um, which would lead markets driving interest rates up. But they also don't want to drive interest rates up too quickly, uh, because that, of course, could um, uh, could make things very problematic for um, for debtors. And we know that uh, countries, as well as a lot of firms, are, are heavily in debt. So they're walking that tightrope. So far, I think, doing a good job, because now they're moving more aggressively, which I think they definitely need to, uh, but it hasn't spooked the markets. 
they may need to move more aggressively, exactly as uh, I was just, just said, and um, communication is going to be the key. Can they do that without making the markets um, move too, um, uh, too rapidly in a way that they don't want? Uh, and Katrine, what are you constructive on right now? What do you buy in the markets, given what we heard from the Fed? Well, I think there are a couple of reasons um, that are in favor of risky asset classes still as we head towards 2022. First of all, global growth is moderating, but this is not the end of the cycle. Um, stagflation or recession fears are overdone, in my view. Um, secondly, um, the inflation um, spike is real, but central banks are starting to inching towards uh, normalization. And so far, they really remain behind the curve. So monetary policy is stimulus has peaked, but st policy stimulus remains accommodative, accommodative as well. So taking myself, this uh, speaks still in favor of risky asset classes. A risk that I would see, um, or there are actually two risks that are also currently um, could be putting a damper on the festive mood in um, in markets, first of all, if um, central banks going forward were turning even more hawkish, and secondly, of course, um, pandemic-related uncertainty. Um, uh, Randy, overall, what does the Fed's decision actually mean for the Bank of England? If you look at the Bank of England, and I know we're both here in London, it's probably one of the most complicated, you know, complicated ones to navigate, especially given the wild swings in the market. I think the, the, the question is um, what is going to be um, the, uh, the impact of the, uh, the variant and the policy response to the variant. So clearly in the U.S., the interpretation has been this may pose more supply constraints, push more pressure on inflation, and so they need to act faster. Uh, I think what we've been hearing from the Bank of England is that, well, this is going to perhaps slow economic activity as we'll put up with some of the uh, supply constraints uh, and price pressures for a little bit rather than move too soon. I'm a little bit worried about that. I think it would be better to, to move a little bit sooner. Um, I think that uh, we're finding out that the, uh, the variant fortunately doesn't seem to be uh, very, um, very problematic for health. It's very, very infectious, but, uh, but not nearly as, uh, as problematic as the others. And so if we don't see significant lockdowns, we don't see uh, significant health consequences, the economy is going to be coming back. And so I think they really need mm -hmm. to be staying ahead of inflation. So I'd actually be a little bit more on the, the Fed side for the Bank of England than, uh, than for the Bank of England side right now. So, Ryan, do you actually think that they'll raise rates today, or is that a little bit, you know, too, I, I don't know if it's aggressive, the right word, but, you know, too surprising? Yeah, well, they've been willing to surprise the markets before. Everyone thought they were going to raise, and they, they didn't raise them. So, um, so I put a higher uh, probability of surprise for the Bank of England for, than for the, uh, the U.S. My preference would be that they go in that direction, but certainly the communication over the last few weeks has been they're going to wait and see because of the uncertainties around uh, the economic consequences of the virus. Um, and Katrine, what's your take on the Bank of England, and what does it mean for your appetite or not for U.K. assets? Well, I think the Bank of England, as has been laid out, is currently facing a dilemma. And today is probably a 50-50 um, decision because um, clearly the conditions for rate hike have been met. Inflation is overshooting. The labor market has weathered the end of the furlough scheme very well. But then on the other hand, there are near-term risk losing, uh, looming con um, concerning the Omicron variant. But overall, whether they will hike in December or delay their decision uh, to February, the Bank of England will likely still be the first G4 central bank to lift off rates, to hike rates and start the tightening cycle. And also in um, on August, they laid out in a report how they are going uh, to progress with quantitative tightening. So I would still think that they are more on the hawkish side of the spectrum. Now, Turning to um, to UK assets, I think the pound sterling continues to face a difficult time. It has not been able to capitalize on the yield advantage so far, um, given the short-term economic downside risks, also more structural um, economic risks related um, to Brexit, for example. Um, regarding UK gilts, um, I would also be more on the cautious side um, because of the um, rate hike uh, potential regarding um, 
regarding the Bank of England. Now turning to UK equities, we have to keep in mind, and particularly longer term investors, that UK equities are among the rare markets in equity land that are still attractively um, valued and offer hence um, potential for investors that are um, have yeah. a longer term time horizon. Um, Randy, what's your take on ECB? Again, I mean, we're not expecting huge, you know, huge waves from the ECB apart from PEP, and that's also because of the kind of economy that they're dealing with. Right, they haven't seen quite the same uh, level of inflation. The inflation certainly is, is going up, and I think it's important for them to be ahead of the curve. They're also concerned about the um, uh, the consequences of, uh, of policy responses to to the variant. So I think they are. Um, I think they've made it pretty clear that they're going to be sitting tight for a while. Uh, but I think they're going to be starting to see a lot of inflationary pressures. We sort of saw it first in the U.S. Obviously, there are global supply chain issues, but we heard uh, we're having more inflation in the U.S. because there's been so much fiscal impulse. Um, there's then now we've seen Bank of England, well, now we've seen in England, um, uh, record levels of inflation for or record levels that uh, you know, we haven't seen in decades. And I think the um, uh, Eurozone is going to be seeing that soon. So I think it would be wise for them to um, be positioning things to be able to move forward. But I don't think they're going to act. Uh, I don't think they're going to take an action today. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Uh, of course, uh, Randy Krosner there of Chicago Booth School and Anne Katrin Peterson of Allianz. Uh, coming up, we'll have plenty more on central banks and inflation. This is Bloomberg. The Fed signals inflation as public enemy number one, laying out a roadmap for a faster rate hikes and global stocks surge. Super Thursday, the Bank of England and ECB are two in a flood of central bankers reporting today. The twin specters of inflation and Omicron loom large. And stay with Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. This hour, we have a top lineup of guests. Later on, we speak to the Generali Chief Executive, Philippe Donnet. But up next, BlackRock's Elgo Barch joins us. And you can send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, first, let's check in on the markets after the Fed, of course, and Jay Powell talked yesterday. It's very clear that the markets are not only taking in their stride, but they like what they heard from the Fed, partly because he was maybe a bit more dovish than they were expecting. Yes, he will raise rates, but the policy clarity actually is something that the market has been wanting from some time. And the emphasis was definitely on Jay Powell saying, that actually when it comes to the economy, he won't jeopardize anything. So if you look at the 210 spreads, uh, it's very clear that that yield curve steepening suggests that maybe markets see it as a little bit more dovish than initially yesterday. The 10-year German yield, you can see uh, currently um, at minus 0355. And we had that news that the German federal government will sell about 410 billion euros in debt in 2022. Now, Jay Powell signals inflation is now public enemy number one. The Fed governor has announced a faster pace of tapering and he also lay out the roadmap for rate hikes. Supply and demand imbalances related to the pandemic and the reopening of the economy have continued to contribute to elevated levels of inflation. These problems have been larger and longer lasting than anticipated. We are phasing out our purchases more rapidly because with elevated inflation pressures and a rapidly strengthening labor market, the economy no longer needs increasing amounts of policy support. The economy is so much stronger. I was here at the Fed when we lifted off the last time, and the economy is so much stronger now, it's so much closer to full employment. There's a provision, uh, it, it w used to be called the balanced approach provision. It is a, a, a provision that would enable us to, in this case, because of high inflation, move before achieving maximum employment. Inflation stays higher for longer and central banks nudge interest rates up. Well, those are two of the predictions for next year from BlackRock. In their 2022 outlook, they also see real yields rising gradually and they continue to favor equities over fixed income. Well, joining us now to talk about her predictions and her team's prediction for 2022, Dr. Elga Barch, BlackRock's head of macro research. Elga, thank you so much for joining us. First of all, congratulations on a beautiful piece of research. It's, you know, easy to read and easy to follow. You, you know, entitled it Thriving in a New Market Regime. How different do you expect that market regime to be? We think it's uh, highly unusual, in fact, the first uh, in that we expect two consecutive years 
of uh, rising equity markets and falling bond markets. This has never happened since we um, have the data available, which is essentially the last five decades. Highly unusual. It's a continuation of what we saw this year. Uh, and lots of it has to do with central banks. Yeah, and central banks who basically say that inflation will remain persistently high, though maybe not as high as we're seeing at the moment. This is in your research note, partly because supply chains, I guess, issues will ease somewhat. Is there a risk that in 2022, central banks, including the Fed, will have to be more aggressive in normalizing? Uh, we don't think that's going to happen. Um, in fact, we think relative to the inflation picture, central banks will uh, react uh, in a more muted fashion than they would have done in the past. Uh, this is what we coined the new nominal. Um, mm -hmm. But um, we will all need to learn to live with inflation because inflation is likely to stay above uh, central bank objectives, marginally, moderately above, not to the extent what we're seeing now. So inflation is going to moderate um, if and when it's difficult to predict, given um, uncertainties around the Omicron uh, virus variation and so on. Um, but um, inflation is and has already shifted into a higher inflation regime. Uh, and you also lay out, so the space case is a new nominal, and then, you know, the safety premium could be questioned. Where does that drive markets? So the two um, concerns that we have for government bond markets, which is why we're underweight. One is inflation. We are not compensated adequately as a holder of nominal government bonds for the inflation risk. Uh, that is that you are implicitly taking. Uh, and the other uh, aspect indeed is that the yield curve at the moment is still very flat. Uh, we have had a massive increase in um, government debt and the sustainability of that debt load crucially depends on market expectations of uh, low inflation, meaning lower interest rates. And that is potentially quite a fragile equilibrium, as we have warned before. And so that could mean that you see a steeper yield curve, uh, which we coined the, uh, the term premium revenge. Um, Elga, talk to me about, you know, what if things don't really go to plan? I mean, you also have, you know, a, a, so you have your base case scenario looking at 2022, but then, you know, some of the other things is, for example, stagnation because of growth surplus, inflation pressures um, abate because of labor market, uh, you know, the labor market slack holds back wage growth. How do you see that developing? Yeah, so indeed, um, what, I mean, because the, the market regime that we're in is highly unusual, um, there is also a higher degree of uncertainty around it than usual, which is why we have decided to dial back the risk uh, a little bit. And um, we outline in the report that you mentioned um, a number of alternative scenarios um, that um, sort of could evolve depending on either the reaction of financial markets to incoming information or on the reaction of central banks to it. And the stagnation one could could be could be uh, one alternative. Um, you know, Dr. Barch, one of the other things that you you know try and lay out is cutting through the confusion. Where do you think the main confusion for the markets, or from you know what analysts are looking at, comes through? Um, I think the main confusion is really coming um, from not being disciplined enough, sticking with a framework, remembering that this is not your usual business cycle recovery. This is a restart. Never before have we stopped the global economy in its tracks and then started restarted it in a pretty um, aggressive fashion. Um, and as a result, uh, we have seen all these demand supply mismatches. Um, we, we, we still are in something that is um, completely unprecedented, also in macroeconomic terms. And I think the danger is always to fall back into traditional business cycle um, analysis and, um, and sort of misread the incoming information. Mm -hmm. Is that why, I don't know what you make of what, you know, the Fed said yesterday, but that was pl pretty clear in laying out, you know, what the Fed expects. How useful is that for markets? I think it is useful to the extent that you know what the Fed is thinking right now. 
Um, for us, this is completely consistent with the framework of the new nominal, as well as um, a, a Federal Reserve that currently, having achieved its inflation uh, mandate, is focused almost entirely on the employment side, the full employment mandate, and that will dictate um, the timing and uh, also the potentially the pace of the rate hikes, which we expect to be a lot lower than it has been in the past, uh, potentially lower than what the what the dot plot shows. Um, so and make no mistake, central banks would have hiked already if this was a normal business cycle. Yeah. Is that also correct for you know for the? Um well, you look at the Bank of England, I don't know whether the Fed just made their life easier because of what they said yesterday. Yeah, I think the, the Bank of England situation is a little bit different. I think the Fed, you can see from market pricing, is quite firmly controlling um, the, the narrative uh, in financial markets, anchoring it in its, uh, in its uh, views. For the, for the Bank of England, of course, we have seen some back and forth in terms of market pricing. And the market continues to price in that the Bank of England will be forced into reversing its um, tightening cycle in the not too distant future. You don't see that kind of pricing for the Federal Reserve. Um, Dr. Barch, maybe one you know, final question on China, because you also lay out in your research, which is one of the also most interesting bits, that you see a significant China overall policy stance shift. Is the market underestimating that? Um, yes, um, that's, that's very possible. Um, and uh, this has been sort of gradually building already, but we think it's now starting to not only get momentum, but um, also starting to bear fruit in terms of the economic, economic activity in China. And that will mean that after a very pronounced slowdown in GDP growth in the course of this year, Next year, we'll see a pickup again, and that, um, you know, given the size of the Chinese economy, will also mark an important shift for the global economy. Dr. Elga Bartsch, thank you so much for all of the insights and on your 2020 note, BlackRock head of macro research there with that piece of research out. Now, coming up, we'll be talking to Philippe Donet, the chief executive of Generali, Italy's largest insurance group. Send in your questions on IB Plus TV Go. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Omicron has complicated the pandemic and reintroduced volatility into markets, business and people's plans for the coming months. For any industry, it's been a complicated two years, but especially for the insurance business, which has had to shore us up against the risks we face. Well, joining us now is Philippe Donnet, the Chief Executive and Managing Director of Generali. Philippe has served as Chief Executive of Italy's biggest insurance group since 2016 after he led the integration of five of the Generali brands. Now, he's also co-founder of investment group HLD. And yesterday, he also announced uh, this new plan to pay out as much as $6.3 million billion of dividends in plans. Billions, I need to get that right. Mr. Donet, thank you so much for joining us. When you look at uh, what was announced yesterday, so you're going to increase dividend by our shareholders by 2024 up to 5.6 billion euros. Is this because you're optimistic of what's coming up for Generali? Well, hello, Farzim. Thank you for the for the question. Yes, we are uh, optimistic, but our optimism is based on the work uh, we've been doing in those uh, past six years. We've been building strong foundations after a first turnaround plan, then an optimization plan, and now we have a new plan, Lifetime 24, driving growth which is dedicated to the acceleration of the growth, of the profitable and sustainable growth of our group. So this makes us very confident about our ability to, uh, to pay high dividends uh, to our shareholders, as you said, up to 5.6 uh, billion euros in the next uh, three years. We also announced uh, yesterday, for the first time after uh, 15 years, uh, a share buyback of uh, 500 million euros to further boost uh, the return of capital to shareholders. 
Monsieur Donnet, does your strategy change at all, or is it still really expansion in the non-life insurance and asset management that will drive the way forward? Definitely, we are going to continue uh, accelerating uh, the growth on the business lines uh, uh, we like most because they help us to accelerate the diversification of our portfolio, of our portfolio. as you said, uh, property casualty business, but also health insurance business, protection business, and obviously asset management uh, business. Um, give me a sense, um, sir, of where you see the, the, you know, the biggest acquisitions coming from. I think you have about 3 billion euros for acquisitions in asset management and non-life insurance business. Are there any specific sectors or you know, subsectors and countries that you're looking at? After the success of the acquisition of, uh, of Catolica, which uh, allows us to become uh, not only number one on the life insurance in, uh, in Italy, but also number one on the property ca casualty uh, market in Italy, which is one of the most profitable in, in Europe. Uh, we are going to look in, uh, to acquisitions definitely out of Italy. So we will continue uh, strengthening our leadership position in Europe, uh, especially in uh, Central Eastern Europe. And we will also look at uh, opportunities on the asset management on a more global basis, which means that uh, it also includes uh, uh, US and, and UK mm -hmm. for, the, for the asset management. Of course, uh, on a very opportunistic uh, uh, way, we will look at uh, growth opportunities in Asia as well. I mean, would you consider a big transformational M&A a as something that you would look at in the future? You know, for, for us, the, the, the main uh, criteria in terms of M&A is the long-term value creation for all shareholders, for all stakeholders. This is what really matters. So if we are to find a, a big transformational uh, uh, operation that creates long-term value for all stakeholders, we will seriously look at it. But uh, we stick to our strategic uh, discipline, our financial discipline, and we stick to the cultural fit uh, for us. Monsieur Donnet, central banks are also changing a little bit of a shift. Now they're worried about inflation. It's not only inflation because of supply chains, but inflation in general. As a big asset manager and also an insurance company, do you welcome interest rate normalizations, not only from the ECB, but, but, but other um, central banks around the world? Well, our uh, plan is based on uh, an assumption of a flat, uh, low interest rate for a long period of time. If uh, interest rates are to, to raise, it will be uh, only a bonus uh, and uh, extra, it will be extra uh, profits for, uh, for our plan. So we, we, we are, this is a good, uh, definitely a good scenario for a life insurance company, especially for the, for the and for the property casualty uh, business, inflation is good because it's a, a good way to, to, to increase uh, the premiums. So uh, this uh, new uh, scenario, if it's confirmed, is only positive for generally. Um, I mean, the new strategy, of course, comes as you have two shareholders that are seeking to challenge, um, you know, some of the things that you've been putting at the top. What's been the reaction from the board on that? Yesterday, we had uh, uh, an investor day. We presented our plan to the, to the market. This plan was approved the day before by the, the board of directors. The reaction of the market was very positive on, on our plan. So this is uh, what really matters. Um, but do you have an answer to the tycoon critics? I'm very much focused on uh, uh, making our plan work. So for, as of today, I'm still focused on executing successfully uh, the, our present plan, generally 2021. We have another two weeks to go. And frankly speaking, uh, to be able to confirm all the targets of this plan, which were very ambitious, despite two years of COVID-19 crisis is, is a great performance. And starting on January 1st, together with my team, we will be focused on the execution of the new plan. And this is what really matters to, to investors. Um, Monsieur Donnet, can you talk to us a little bit about some of the you know, digital technology that you'll be adopting 
have, you know, how much more of an increased focus will we be able to see on that in the next couple of years? We're going to invest 1.1 billion euro in the next three years on technology, on, on digital, with basically two, two objectives. Uh, we want to further improve the efficiency of our, uh, of our management, of our policies uh, administration. Uh, we want to decrease cost. We want to decrease the, the headcount with more automation so that's what the first objective of this investment the second one is to be able to deliver a best in class digital inter interaction with our customers because lifetime partner 24 means that we want to be a real partner to our customers 24 hours a day and seven days a week and this requires uh, a step a step forward in terms of use of yeah. the digital technology uh, Mr. Donet, on, on ESG, how important is the role of insurers and how the, you know, important is the role of asset managers in driving this agenda for ESG by 2050? And is there a real danger of stranded assets? As generally, we have a double strong commitment to, uh, to sustainability, to, to uh, ESG, uh, on, as an insurance company and as a long-term investment. So we want our insurance portfolio uh, to be uh, more and more ESG, as well as we want our investment, our assets portfolio to be more and more ESG. We are uh, founder, member founder of the Net Zero uh, Insurance Alliance. We are also part of the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. And as you have seen in our new plan, the commitment to uh, sustainability has been uh, strongly increased sustainability is uh, included in every decision we take in everything uh, we yeah. do so we have strong commitments in our plan on, on sustainability and also on, uh, particularly on climate change and inclusion yeah. and diversity Monsieur Donet, thank you so much for joining us. Philippe Donet there, the Chief Executive of Generali, for an exclusive conversation this morning. Now, coming up, the UK is warning about the spread of Omicron after hitting a record 78,000 total new COVID cases on Wednesday. More on that next. This is Bloomberg. There will be an increasing number of Omicron patients going into the NHS, going into hospital, going into intensive cares, uh, and the exact ratios we don't yet know, but that there will be substantial numbers and that that will begin to become apparent, in my view, uh, fairly soon after Christmas. It'll start before then, but in terms of the big numbers, uh, I think that's a reasonably, uh, I'm afraid, a reasonably uh, nailed-on prospect. That was England's Chief Medical Officer, Chris Weedy. Now joining us now is Laura Wright in London. Laura, so what are the key takeaways from the press conference yesterday? The highest number of COVID cases since January. Omicron is now the dominant strain. What is notable, the Prime Minister wanted to paint a buoyant picture, emphasising vaccination records reached on Monday, booster shot records reached on Tuesday. His language was militarised, talking about an emerging territorial army. But Chris Whitty was more sombre. Chris Whitty said it's crucial to get your booster jab because the efficacy of just two shots is reduced against new strains. And you can see here, it's all about when cases can catch up with hospitalizations for unseen. Laura, thank you so much. Bloomberg's Laura Wright in London. Now, we also want to clarify an earlier report where we mistakenly said most of those hospitalized with COVID are unvaccinated. We are phasing out our purchases more rapidly because with elevated inflation pressures and a rapidly strengthening labor market, the economy no longer needs increasing amounts of policy support. I do think you're seeing a bit more panic instead of patience within the ranks of the FOMC and the dot plot as well. But if you look at the Fed's forecast, in some ways it doesn't really hang together. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 6 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Thursday, December the 16th. Our top stories today. Fallout from the Fed. Investors speculate that policy tightening will help fight inflation without stopping growth. Stocks rose in Asia and Europe. 
The spotlight shifts to the Bank of England and the ECB will look at what their next moves might be. Tightening up the border, France will impose tougher rules on travel from the UK as it tries to slow the spread of the Omicron variant. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance, everybody. This is the early edition from London. I'm Anna Edwards with Caroline Hyde, uh, who's in for Kayleigh Lines this week. Matt Miller is with us, of course, in Berlin. And Matt, so uh, the long-awaited hawkish moves from the Fed, but you wouldn't, know, you wouldn't know it to look at the market response, the market responding as if we'd heard something fairly dovish from the uh, central bank. Yeah, I think uh, Tom McKenzie put it perfectly on Bloomberg Radio this morning when he said it was a dovish, hawkish tilt. You know, I was blown <laughs> away by the moves we saw in the S&P yesterday. So stocks having their best rally since 2020. And today, um, you still see that coming through in Asia. You can see the MSCI Asia Pacific is a gainer up three quarters of 1% at the close. The Nikkei up more than 2%. So real gains in Japan, not as strong in Hong Kong, the Hang Seng gaining, but only two tenths of 1%. And you do still see a bid for the dollar against the yen. You can buy now more than 114 yen for your dollar. Otherwise, you don't see the dollar gaining ground, which I thought was really interesting. If the central bank, if the Fed is going to be raising rates more than expected, right? Three times instead of two times next year, you would expect assets to pile into the dollar. But if you take a look at the Bloomberg dollar index, you'll see that it's not as high as it was yesterday. Pull up the uh, U.S. assets and let me take a look here. The S&P futures are higher again after that rally yesterday. Do we call it a monster rally still? 1.6%, pretty big. But the dollar index down at 11.83. Yesterday it was at 11.88. So it must have been a dovish, hawkish tilt. Meanwhile, if the Fed is going to raise rates to fight inflation, you would expect investors to let go of their inflation hedges. We always hear that gold is an inflation hedge. And yet, um, they're bid today. So gold is up to $1,785, $1,786 a troy ounce. I think it's very interesting. You're also seeing investors buy bonds, pushing those yields down to $144.80. There's actually a great piece on the MLive blog comparing what happened in JGBs in the past compared to what we're seeing now in Treasury yields. And MLive is saying you could see just more money piling into Treasuries, even with expectations of interest rate hikes, even with those new bonds later down the road having higher rates. And as a result, you're going to see more pressure on yields. Carolyn, what are you seeing happen in Europe? Well, the catch-up rally is upon us here in Europe. After that monster move, as you call it, in the S&P 500, the stock 600 gets a wiggle on as well. I'm looking at Germany up about 1.5%, really leading the pack. France as well up almost a percentage point. The UK slight lagged off by 9 tenths percent. Spain as well really rallying higher. We're up to the highest since about December the 9th. This clearly is in most industry groups in the green, particularly miners, particularly tech. These are the sort of industry groups that you will still perform well. Let's dig in across asset, though. I want to look at the FX market, because as you were saying, it's all about dollar weakness. What therefore for the pound, up two tenths of a percent. Anna so eloquently putting it that all eyes now focus on the Bank of England and the ECB. Now, there is an outside chance, according to the market, that we could see a move from the MPC over at the Bank of England. We get a little bit of pound strength because, of course, that inflation read that we had earlier in the week coming in strong. However, most people feel that they will hold steady and not see a rate hike as soon as today. We see the Europe, Europeans also being eyed as we look at the euro up two tenths of percent, the ECB. Could we get a slightly hawkish flavour out of Madame Lagarde? And once again, inflation, will it prove transitory? Inflation, a lot to do with gas prices, energy prices, but still many are wondering what sort of a line Christine Lagarde, who herself is perhaps far more dovish than the rest of her European central bankers. Airbus, I want to dig into the nitty gritty, up 3%. They win a big order from Qantas, beating out Boeing, so look up for Airbus on the rise as they get a deal for 40 new aeroplanes. And boohoo is boohoo today. I mean, how many part times has that pun been used, right? But it's off by 16%, falling to a five-year low as freight costs, surprise, surprise, hit them hard. So too does apparently us not sticking to our party frocks. We keep changing them and sending them back, and that costs, Anna. Absolutely. So as those parties get cancelled, those, those dresses are returned. And as you say, Caroline, Boohoo is the name of the company, not just a description of the share price move. Let's get a look then at the things that lie ahead. A lot of central bank meetings, but it's not all about that. EU leaders are gathering in Brussels. It's the first time Germany's new Chancellor, Olaf Scholz, joins in that new capacity. The main topics on the agenda will be Russia, energy prices, those two linked, of course, and the response to COVID. That's a fast-moving situation across Europe. We have the Bank of England decision at 7 a.m 
a.m. New York time. Uh, the BOE is expected to hold rates amid concern about the Omicron variant. More details on that shortly. And we have the ECB decision at 7.45 a.m. New York time. The central bank is on track to announce the end of the pandemic emergency purchase program, the so-called PEP, and the expansion of the APP, the Asset Purchase Program, that little handover, that relay between one package and the next, a focus of the ECB's meetings. Let's get into the key takeaways from the Fed and what to watch out for then from these big central bank meetings coming today, the Bank of England and the ECB. Joining us now to take a look at all of these things, uh, Markets Editor Christine Aquino, our UK Economy Reporter Lizzie Burden and our ECB Reporter Jana Rando joins us now from Frankfurt. Let's start with the market reaction to the Fed then with our Markets Editor Christine Aquino. Kino. Christine, a really big rally for global stocks, a monster rally, as Matt was suggesting, in particular in tech names. Did that make sense to you, the fact that markets seem to put aside concerns about tighter interest rates and say, this is good, this is the Fed taking the inflation uh, threat pretty seriously? Well, Anna, I got to tell you, when I looked at the market reaction this morning, I was equally scratching my head over what gives. Because as you say, if you look just at the market reaction, you would have concluded that the Fed did something dovish yesterday. But in fact, it was quite the opposite. And I think the best explanation that I've seen for this so far is this idea that if the Fed is prioritizing a faster tapering and more rate hikes in 2022, then that means that they're going to have to do much less beyond next year. And I think investors are betting that that would be enough to fight these inflationary pressures in the short term without harming long-term growth. And therefore, we're seeing a bit of an everything rally. I think I would call this actually a Goldilocks rally today, given that we're seeing most um, uh, bonds and stocks as well as commodities rallying today on the back of a softer dollar in the Fed's aftermath. We thank you, Markets Editor Christine and Kino. Of course, we've got so much more to expect when it comes to the Bank of England as well. And Lizzie Burden, our UK economy reporter, is with us. Lizzie, I mean, interesting that dollar weakness that we continue to see leading to pound strength today. What are you anticipating in terms of, well, how the Bank of England balances a fear of Omicron, the virus, with these inflationary pressures? Well, yeah, it's been such a back and forth over the past six weeks, Caroline. Uh, first, after the November decision, it seemed like uh, all the Bank of England needed to convince it to raise rates would be strong jobs data. Then along came Omicron and the new restrictions, and it seemed like, uh, well, you had... Uh, Michael Saunders, the most hawkish member of the Monetary Policy Committee, saying that even he wanted to wait for clearer data on the new variant before voting to raise rates. And then, just when we thought that a December rate hike was off the table, along came the CPI print. And it's the highest in more than a decade, 5.1% in November. So Bloomberg Economics now says that you just can't rule out a rate hike today, even though it's not its base case. And it would be a historic moment. It would be the first, post, the first pandemic rate rise. All right, Lizzie, thanks very much for that. Lizzie Burden, our UK economics reporter. Expect to see her on television all day today as we uh, follow the BOE's movements. Let's go right now, though, to Frankfurt, to the ECB. Jana Rondau, our ECB reporter, standing by there. And here we have a possible end to the PEP program. What are we watching for, Jana? Yeah, definitely the uh, asset purchases under uh, the pandemic program uh, are expected to come to an end in March as planned. The more interesting decision will be what happens to the APP, to the regular asset purchase program. Um, economists expect a temporary increase in the pace um, from April when the PEP expires. Um, how much uh, that will be very much uh, very interesting to see the ecb might also grant itself a little more flexibility in how it reinvests bonds uh, purchased under the pab just to smooth out any volatility in markets to be able to address any any fragmentation that might occur in the future uh, as for interest rates those are uh, quite some time off as policymakers of all stripes have confirmed and that of course has to do with the inflation outlook unlike in the us um, the ecb still considers what we see as mostly transitory. Um, they've said it might take longer than expected um, to clear, but they do see inflation coming back below 2% um, after next year. And that will um, basically make them sit a lot tighter than, than Jay Powell in the US. Yana, thanks very much. Yana Randall.
uh, joining us on the ECB. Now that is uh, our our central bank whip, thanks to Christine Aquino, uh, our UK economy reporter Lizzie Burden as well, and ECB reporter Yana Randau in Frankfurt. Let's get down to Washington, D.C. President Biden says he'll back Senate Democrats taking on voting rights legislation if they have the votes for passage. He calls that the single biggest issue. Meanwhile, the president's nearly $2 trillion economic agenda is stalled by fighting, infighting really, among uh, his own party members and may be delayed into the new year. Jack Fitzpatrick joins us, our Bloomberg government reporter from D.C. So, Jack, what do we know about, first off, Build Back Better? Well, first of all, both of these bills, the Build Back Better social tax and spending bill and uh, the voting rights bill are, are bills that the president supports. So it's no surprise to hear that if they have the votes for either one, he's fine with it. The issues with the tax and spending bill uh, initially were delays focused on the state and local tax deduction, in particular who that would apply to and how much money you have to make before it would be cut off and you wouldn't get the increased deduction. Lately, though, uh, it has become a little less clear exactly where Senator Joe Manchin stands on the child tax credit, which really is a centerpiece of this bill that it would currently uh, extend for a year into December 2022. So those are really the two key issues, and it's become more and more obvious recently that it, they, they aren't on a timeline that makes passage look likely by the end of this calendar year. Lawmakers I've talked to are talking more about January and trying to make those tax benefits retroactive, mm. uh, even though they cut off at the end of this year. So it, it, that, that's why you're hearing talk of maybe switching floor time to another Democratic bill. Okay, so that's the uh, that's the, that's the issues with uh, uh, with the Democrats' agenda. Let's talk about the relationship with China and the talk about clampdowns, further sanctions on Chinese chip makers. We've covered this over recent days, but I think there's a, a coming together, a meeting taking place today. Yes, so our colleagues uh, Jenny Leonard and Ian King have reported there is set to be a meeting today from officials from the departments of uh, Commerce, Defense energy and state to discuss uh, an increase on the restrictions on exports to the largest Chinese uh, semiconductor uh, manufacturer, the semiconductor, semiconductor Manufacturing International Corporation. Uh, the key change in language here would restrict uh, technology going to them from what is currently described as technology uniquely required to create advanced chips, and that would be expanded to technology capable for use to create advanced chips. Uh, so that's a, a ramp up in sort of the current existing uh, restrictions on those exports that should be discussed today. Jack, thanks very much. Uh, thanks to Jack Fitzpatrick of Bloomberg Government. Now a look at uh, some of the stocks moving in pre-market trading. Matt, what has caught your eye? Well, I'm glad Jack talked a little bit about those tech stocks and, and the problems that the U.S. may have with the Chinese companies because it's actually not holding them back at all. Take a look first off at Apple. It's up eight tenths of percent in the pre-market. It had a great day yesterday of two and a half percent, which is a lot for a two point nine trillion dollar and change company. Uh, today could be the day. I said this a couple days ago, but today could be the day where you see the first company eclipsing three trillion dollars in market value. Um, definitely watch Apple. They also have delayed their corporate return to office deadline from February 1st. They were going to get everyone back in their seats at that point, but now they're saying uh, date yet to be determined with Omicron. AMD is one that I want to um, highlight. Advanced micro devices up one and a quarter percent in the pre-market, but also other chip makers. Intel up four tenths of a percent. Taiwan Semiconductor was the biggest point addition on um, the MSCI Asia Pacific. So that's not being held back. These aren't being held back by um, what we see out of Washington really rallying. These two aren't as big as you'd think. Only 200, uh, about $200 billion each in terms of market cap. TSMC is worth about half uh, a trillion dollars in market cap. Tesla is obviously worth twice that. Take a look at Tesla in the pre-market. Bloomberg had a great piece out yesterday calculating that Elon Musk's tax bill will be $10 billion this year if he exercises all of his options. 
He has been selling shares. It's not weighing on Tesla today in the pre-market. He's raised about 12 billion so far. And with that, he will become the uh, highest, he'll have the highest tax bill in American history. He will have paid more taxes in one year than anybody else in history, Anna. Something he likes to talk about on Twitter, I know. Uh, those are the pre-market movers then. Coming up on the program, we'll look ahead to the Bank of England and the ECB meetings. Uh, we'll do that with Sarah Hewin, Head of Europe and America's Research at Standard Chartered. Plus, France restricting travel from the UK. We'll discuss efforts to contain the spread of Omicron in Europe. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller in Berlin alongside Carolyn Hyde and Anna Edwards in London. Now, we had a real change, a sea change yesterday in terms of what we're, we're expecting from the Fed, or at least what the Fed is telegraphing to us. Now, three rate hikes are forecast for 2022 rather than two in the past. Nonetheless, that has not held back tech shares. I'll welcome our listeners on Bloomberg Radio and tell you that I've got a chart showing NASDAQ 100 futures in yellow, S&P E-minis in blue, and tech stocks are keeping up um, with the bigger benchmark. That's despite rising yields. Here at the bottom, we have a panel of Treasury two-year yields that continue to come higher. Ven Rom joins us, our currency and rate strategist at Bloomberg MLive. And Ven, currency and rates is your focus, not obviously tech and stock futures, but why would uh, a sector that's supposed to do poorly in the face of rising rates continue to climb? Morning, Matt, that's a great question. Yes, NASDAQ futures are holding up fine today, but we are well off the high scene in November. Look, this is, a, uh, this is not a sprint, this is a marathon. Uh, the decision is not going to be, uh, the ultimate decision on NASDAQ or tech stocks is not going to be made today. It's going to be made over the next one and a half, two years, uh, or even into 2024, as the, as the Fed starts raising rates. Now, if you see in the recent uh, few weeks alone, we have seen more than one standard deviation moves in recent weeks. And those have begun to occur more and more frequently, suggesting that the markets are indeed very, very nervous. If the Fed is going to raise rates three times next year, I would expect the two-year yield to cross 120. And in that atmosphere, there's bound to be a reassessment of tech stock valuations. My analysis shows that the base case is that they will tread water. If they need to post gains, then we need above-trend earnings growth next year. If we get those above-trend oh. earnings growth, then they will be fine. Yeah, I wonder how the wages story will play in there in the tightness of labour markets. Let's think about the inflation impulse here in Europe, uh, Ven, and I'm thinking here about the Bank of England firstly. Uh, we, it seems the Bank of England narrative has developed so quickly. First, we were sure they were going to hike. Then we thought they wouldn't and they'd hold. And now we're really not sure again. What is your expectation for the BOE? Well, I, I, no one knows for sure, but uh, the fact that, that we do not have a presser today kind of skews the outcome towards a hold. Uh, but I wouldn't be, as you, as you said, I wouldn't be surprised. Now, it's it's about the communication, isn't it? I mean, the BOE has made, uh, a, you know, the communication is not be, has been so unreliable. We could expect pretty much anything today, and that would be par for the course. And they would defend it as saying that, look, we have already flagged a rate increases coming down the pipeline. And what have we got in terms of data this week? We showed that uh, it showed that labor market is expanding robustly, and inflation, RPA inflation, is 7%. So they can't ignore this. The writing is on the wall for the BOE. The question is whether or not they go today, if not today, February. But the Fed's okay. move pivot overnight means that they have the conviction now to move. Yes, absolutely. That's a really interesting parallel you draw across the Atlantic and how that reads into the UK narrative. Ben, thanks very much. Ben Ram of the Bloomberg Markets Live team. And remember, you can get up-to-date market analysis. Check out the MLIV blog. MLIV Go is the function to use on your terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Caroline Hyde with Anne Edwards in London and Matt Miller in Berlin. 
Now let's get to the first word news and the French utility EDF fell the most in more than 10 months. Now the company says it will miss its profit target this year in part because of faults in its nuclear power reactors. EDF has found problems in two of its 56 French reactors. Two others have been halted for checks. Six retailers in Europe are restricting Brazilian beef purchases. That's after a new report that links cattle production in Brazil to deforestation. Sainsbury's in the UK, Carrefour and Delays in Belgium are among those who've quit buying Brazilian beef products. And this may be the biggest deal ever in music for an individual artist. Bruce Springsteen reportedly has sold his masters and music publishing to Sony, according to Billboard. The price is around $500 million. Sony was said to have been in talks to buy the album catalogue with Universal Music Publishing conducting the sale. Anna. Caroline, thank you. Now, coming up on the programme, Sarah Kewin, head of Europe and America's research at Standard Chartered. We will talk to her about the central bank decisions still to come. We'll get to her reaction to what we heard from the Fed and the threat of Omicron. To what extent is that factored into her numbers for next year? This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition from London. I'm Anna Edwards with Caroline Hyde in for Kayleigh Lines this week. Matt Miller is with us, of course, in Berlin. And Caroline, when we look at the European equity markets this morning, up by more than 1%, really picking up on that positivity, that risk on mood yeah. that we saw on Wall Street yesterday, all sectors in positive territory here in Europe. It's as if the market is, is, is not taking the hawkish message from the Fed, saying actually that was just the Fed catching up with where the market already was. I mean, Jay Powell walked that fine line and walked it brilliantly. Yeah, man managing to give this idea of a soft landing to the US economy in general. And interestingly, of course, Europe could stand to be a key beneficiary in a more hawkish, even though it's a dovish hawkish tilt coming mm. from the Fed, because there's more value stocks here mm. rather than growth stocks. Maybe that's the way we start to see the fund managers reassert their allocation of their overall equity portfolio. So we could see Europe continue to yeah, that win was out. Certainly the view of one of the fund managers I spoke to this morning who was saying there's still further to go on those value plays. Um, Matt, what are you seeing as we head towards the start of the US trading day? As you pointed out to Ben Rahm, it was perhaps surprising to see that tech stocks gained as much as they did, kept pace with other stocks during yesterday's session. Yeah, well, I guess we're sticking with that narrative of dovish, hawkish tilt. I've heard that from TMAC today. I just heard it from Caroline Hyde. Ven Rom was basically saying something similar. Um, we're seeing tech stocks really driven higher. The market uh, is up in terms of equities. You're even seeing people buy bonds. They're buying gold right now. Um, it, it just doesn't look like we all of a sudden are realizing that three rate hikes could come in 2022 rather than two as previously expected. Maybe as Christine Aquino said, it's because we now expect one in 2023 rather than three then. Take a look at the uh, stocks in Europe up more than 1%, as Caroline said, playing a little bit of catch up to the 1.6% rally that we had yesterday in the US. S&P futures, even after that, are still up half a percent. The 10-year yield, as I said, coming down a little bit. So investors buying bonds, even though more rate hikes are expected this year, or sorry, next year, um, than we thought previously. And Bitcoin is actually, well, call it unchanged right now at 49,142. The pre-market, I think, looks really interesting for a number of reasons. I was talking to you earlier about Apple. It's up in the pre-market and it's worth $2.94 trillion so it just needs to gain a little bit more to push through that three trillion dollar range. Tesla up two and a third percent, even with Elon Musk selling shares. He's still got, I think, seven billion dollars worth of share sales to go to get to that 10 percent level. So far, he's raised 12 billion, but he may have, maybe if he exercises all of his options, a 10 billion dollar tax bill this year. That would be a record for the United States of America. Maybe globally a record. Roblox is a gainer today, even though there was disappointing news yesterday in terms of users. So maybe this is a little bit of a bounce back. I just put it in here because I hear, do I hear you and Caroline talking about Roblox or the two of you players? Oh. Maybe in any case, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's the biggest gainer in the pre-market. And then the here's kids, the interesting the thing. I know, I'm just kidding around. Here's the interesting thing. Of all of the pre-market movers in the U.S. market, there's only one loser. You almost never see that. Snowflake is the only one down after reports that it, uh, Goldman Sachs is executing a block trade, a big block trade of Snowflake shares.
Oh, that IPO, darling, how far it has fallen. And Matt, I mean, apparently Anna's kids are quite into Roblox. Mine is still a bit young, but I'm keen <laughs> to get them into it. Meanwhile, I'm looking at volatility and volatility in FX. Because surprise, surprise, there's 20 central banks that we have coming out with their policy information this week. It matters. It matters in terms of your volatility. It matters in terms of your hedging. In fact, the euro was never this expensive to hedge on a one-day basis. Since all the way back to November 2020, when we had the US election, people had anxiety. Now, that anxiety but dialed down a little bit, but look, the vol is still at about a level of 14. What will Christine Lagarde do today in terms of her, her own dovish, hawkish walking of that tightrope? Sarah Hewins with us, head of Europe and America's research at Standard Chartered Bank, who can talk us through, well, your thesis. I'm hearing some interesting notes, Sarah, about the fact that maybe Madame Lagarde, who's perhaps one of the more dovish on the ECB, could be forced to talk a little bit more hawkish as we've seen inflation rise across there as well. She'll certainly have to acknowledge that inflation is up and we expect that to be reflected in the forecasts when they're released today as well, certainly for next year. But uh, one point that she has made over and over again is that she expects that inflation is going to come back down towards the Fed's tar uh, towards the ECB's target and below indeed by 2023 and the new 2024 forecast should show something similar. So um, I think that the message today is also going to be tinged with caution over Omicron. Uh, Omicron, frankly, was a bit of a footnote in the Fed communications yesterday. And today, of course, we see Norges Bank going ahead with a rate hike despite soaring pandemic cases there and new restrictions imposed. But we've seen the impact of this latest pandemic wave across the euro area in today's survey data, with um, particularly services a lot weaker, especially in Germany, where those restrictions have really bitten. Um, so I think that uh, we're not expecting too many surprises today. Um, Acknowledgement of mm. uh, well above target inflation, but expectations that inflation is going to come back to target and below by 2023. Warnings about the economic impact of the current pandemic wave. Yeah, it does seem, Sarah, that it, in certain parts of continental Europe, the, the measures put in place to fight the Delta wave might be very timely in slowing down the Omicron wave. Might take a little time to, to work out how severe that's going to get in certain parts of Europe. Uh, thinking about where the ECB goes on its pandemic purchase programme then, it, it, are we going to see the end of it in March? It's going to be replaced by the APP. And is the APP going to be increased? I mean, this is all to do with how they continue to do quantitative easing under what guise, under what name? Yes, I mean, it, it, at the moment, it feels a little bit early to call the end of the uh, pandemic emergency. But I, I think it's very difficult at this point for the ECB to dial back on plans to end the PEP in March. Um, but they will want to avoid a cliff edge. They will want to avoid a sharp slowdown in asset purchases. It may be that the, they slow the PEP purchases in um, February, March next year before the program comes to an end and they will probably uh, accelerate the asset purchases with that program really taking over as the main QE program once the PEP has finished and that will be from April. Now, are they going mm. to today indicate precisely what their buying is going to be on a monthly basis from next April? I doubt it. Uh, we may get a, an overall figure. They may just instead reaffirm that that's the plan, end PEP in March um, and mm. hint that the asset purchase program will, will accelerate without giving any data. Sarah, there do seem to be a lot of people watching the Bank of England today and a lot of people suggesting we might get a hold because we don't have a meeting. So there's no way for the Bank of England to really explain its, its thinking to the markets. Perhaps do, do you go along with that? And if you think it is going to be a hold, what does that do to forecast into the future? Because it seems on Omicron Island, it seems to be a long time between December and February. Difficult to say what happens into the new year. Absolutely, and I think that that's a very strong reason for policymakers to stay on hold today. There's a real sense of emergency across the UK currently. Um, we have restrictions, likelihood of uh, additional restrictions being imposed, perhaps as, uh, later this week. And anyway, uh, individuals are embarking on their own personal lockdown. So we've seen 
the hospitality numbers really collapsing. And again, reflected in the services and PMI data that we had today for December. Now, the, it, it would be seem quite uh, bold to raise rates under those circumstances, even though we have had a much higher than expected inflation number for November and a much stronger jobs market in every respect at the latest um, jobs report. But I think that the communication today will continue to indicate that there is going to be a rate hike um, in the coming months. So we would anticipate that that's going to be a 15 basis points hike in February with two more to come after that next year. All right, but still smaller than um, what the Fed is doing, Sarah. We hear so much about the discount European stocks trade to U.S. stocks. Is there any chance that we make some of that up in 2022? I think there is a potential. I do worry that um, Omicron is being downplayed in the US. And clearly at the moment, we don't see cases picking up across the US, but we do know that um, on the ground, uh, you know, s students are, are being um, sent home early. There is a real risk that this uh, Omicron variant takes off over the holiday season, such that when we get into the new year, the U.S. is facing substantially higher cases and accelerating. Some restrictions may need to be brought in. Individuals will adjust their behavior anyway. To me, that suggests that the first quarter is going to see very weak GDP growth. By contrast, hopefully, Europe should be coming out of that. We've had the pandemic wave. We've had the restrictions already. Um, the hope is uh, another feature as well, of course, is booster jabs. So Europe is really accelerating on boosters to pr provide protection against Omicron. In the US, mm. that's still a relatively slow process. OK, thanks very much, Sarah. Sarah Hewin, head of Europe and America's research at Standard Chartered Bank. Still to come on the programme, the UK is warning about the spread of Omicron after reporting a new record high of COVID cases. A record difficult to compare back to history, but a big surge on the day before. And we are hearing just this hour from the Chief Medical Officer for England, Chris Whitty. He's commenting on these numbers, saying they will continue to rise, urging people to limit less important interactions. We'll get an update next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the Principal Room. Coming up later today, an exclusive interview with the American Express chairman and CEO Steve Squarey. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards with Caroline Hyde in London and Matt Miller in Berlin. Let's focus on the UK Omicron story then. The phenomenal pace at which the Omicron strain is spreading across the UK will trigger a surge in hospital admissions over the holiday period. That is according to top medical advisor Chris Whitty. There will be an increasing number of Omicron patients going into the NHS, going into hospital, going into intensive cares. Uh, and exact ratios we don't yet know, but that there will be substantial numbers and that that will begin to become apparent, in my view, uh, fairly soon after Christmas. It'll start before then, but in terms of the big numbers, uh, I think that's a reasonably, uh, I'm afraid, a reasonably uh, nailed-on prospect. Meanwhile, France announced tougher rules on people arriving from the UK after the record rise in cases. Sam Fazeli, Bloomberg Intelligence Senior Pharmaceutical Analyst, joins us now for more. And Sam, it seems that Chris Whitty there, the Chief Medical Officer for England, he seems to, he, he, he's either convinced or at least he's taking a, he's, he's preparing for the worst here, uh, that we are going to see a link between the spike up in cases and hospitalizations. He's certainly not buying into these arguments that this is a milder form of the virus. What do you make of, of the preparation we're seeing here in the UK? Yeah, hi, Anna. Um, so <clears throat> I'm not sure if whether the decision is because he doesn't believe that the, the virus is less or more mild. I think the fact is that even if it is a, a virus that, that, that somehow doesn't cause a more severe disease or it causes a less severe disease, and when you get the numbers of infections that he's talking about, you're not going to have perfect protection for everybody. So there will be 
an inevitable rise in the number of infection uh, hospitalizations. I think that's what he's referring to. So um, we'll see how that pans out. But um, uh, that, that's the worry with, with any verb that, that's got this kind of level of rise in infections. We had a great big take story, Sam, yesterday by Drew Armstrong. Um, and he points out unvaccinated COVID patients are pushing hospital systems past the brink in some U.S. states. Are we going to see this tidal wave of Omicron infections really start to affect the U.S. the way it has Europe? Yeah, so I can't see how it wouldn't unless somehow U.S. magically has a different biological background that doesn't respond. And frankly, there's been no information or data that suggests that, which of course is nonsense. So I can't see how the U.S. will will manage to not have an Omicron wave, given the Santa South Africa did, given that it's basically happening across Europe. So unless there's a mm. change in the way that social distancing works or people are behavior changes, I doubt the U.S. will escape this. Sam, I want to understand about measurement here, though, as well. I've had such anecdotal evidence coming from the US where I'm fortunate enough to be tested weekly in a PCR manner by my business, but the lateral flow tests aren't served in every single pharmacy. They are not given to you on the street. They are not handed out in libraries as they are here in the UK. Is there a me measurement element to that, that it always will look like it's far worse in the UK simply because people are tracking it? Um, well, so I, I think that the UK, in the UK, you do have a very high level of testing that goes on. You're absolutely right. But what the UK also does a lot more of is sequencing, which is when you make sure that you've actually got an Omicron infection. This is important because there is one variant, subvariant of Omicron that actually doesn't show up with the telltale sign called an SGTF on PCR. So you may be, if, if you're just basing it on how many of these odd PCR results you're getting and equating that to Omicron, you will get a false read. So in the US, I, th I think also a lot of people who might test themselves with the lateral flow and are positive won't necessarily report it, not just the US, anywhere. So I think infection rates are much higher everywhere than people actually count in the systems. And Sam, from a tackling perspective, boosters seems to be the focus, whether you're in the US or indeed the UK. Is that the right way to go in terms of impeding the spread to a certain degree? Or how much focus should still now be put upon actually vaccinating those who are unvaccinated? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I really don't think you can separate those two things. It's absolutely crucial. Even if you um, look at the data that just came out of uh, South Africa, with the reduction in, in the uh, effectiveness of the vaccines against infection, put that aside, against hospitalizations, it was still 70% with people who had two, two, sh two shots. So people who don't have the shots are going to be even more exposed to the risks of Omicron because it's so much easier to infect people with it. Um, and I think, therefore, that's absolutely crucial. But you also want to push that 70% back up because especially in the older uh, folks, it will be less than that 70%. And they had some data on that, which we've written on too. Sam, thanks so much. Thanks for joining us. Sam Fazelli of Bloomberg Intelligence. Just hearing from Chris Whitty, the, uh, the medical officer, chief medical officer in, the, in England. He expects an incredibly fast upswing before case rates slow. And just for the global audience, cases in England went up from 59,000 to 78,000 in one day. And this is the Omicron effect. Coming up later today, we'll discuss how the Omicron surge is affecting travel with Delta Airlines CEO Ed Bastian. That is at 1.30 p.m. in New York, 6.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. number of triple C companies in the country and the amount of over leverage in, in companies that have weak balance sheets, even a you know, modest increase in interest rates could be very damaging to them. And then, Tom, it's, it's, a, it's a domino effect. The weak companies go first and then the other companies follow as uh, the economy slows as those companies cut back spending and reduce employment. 
That was the Guggenheim Global CIO, Scott Minard, speaking after the Fed announcement yesterday. Let's get to Tom Keane now, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, who joins us. Uh, and Tom, it seems that the market happy to buy the narrative set out by the Fed that the U.S. economy is strong, it can handle the rate hikes that the Fed has in mind. What are you seeing when you come to, when you come to think about the strength well, of the there, U.S. economy? There, late in the press conference, Anna, there was a moment. We had one leg up, another leg up, and then we had the melt-up up late in the press conference when the uh, chairman had the the courage to go out on the x-axis and there was a just a moment where he talked about the medium uh, in the long term a lot of people looking to this historic day for bank of england and ecb to try to find the medium in the long term there's a lot of people think they will not uh, do that but what was so telling yesterday was his success at conveying the vision out to 223, 224. Let's look at the chart. And this is the summation off of the forecast of a quick approximation of nominal GDP or the animal spirit guesstimates of America. Down we go in the pandemic, up we go with the fiscal recovery, and then we slide off to 2023 and 2024. And Matt Miller, there's just no question about it. He was a huge success at moving out the x-axis. And he doesn't seem as concerned about Omicron snarling the U.S. economy the way it has the U.K. economy. Well, he's not trying to play scientists. There's a lot of people, as we all know, trying to do that. You people are living it with the new uh, restrictions in Italy and France just in the last number of, of hours. But, yeah, I'll take your point on that, Matt, that, that this is uh, uh, a set of economists that are trying to not play scientists. Tom, thanks very much. Looking forward to your program. Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. He's up next. Let's take a look at what else we're watching. I am watching Ducati. It may not surprise you, but <laughs> I have learned from uh, a German television station, NTV, that Ducati has already broken last year's record and thus has sold more motorcycles this year than in any other year in its history. Um, 56,000 bikes, basically, as of the end of November, and they've got a slew of new bikes coming here. You see the new Desert X, which I'm very excited about. So Volkswagen's Ducati unit seems to be firing on all cylinders, which used to be only two, and now <laughs> is all of a sudden four. Oh, very nice, Matt. Very nice. Meanwhile, I'm also keeping a corporate in mind. FedEx, of course, all eyes on the costs that go involved in getting your parcels to you for this Christmas season. We're getting FedEx earnings after the bell. Keep a close eye on how that cost pressure is built up. Just think about the reaction of Boohoo here in European trading and the fact that their freight costs had skyrocketed so much. Of course, that's a clothing company with presence in the UK and the US online. FedEx down 16% over the course of the year, but did rally ever so slightly ahead of mm. these earnings. I feel we should have ended with Matt because I'm just going to take us to a gloomy place. I'm watching the Bank of England, of oh. course. Not that that's gloomy in itself, but they're going to be influenced, of course, by the, by the outbreak of Omicron here in the UK and Chris Whitty, the chief medical officer, just saying now daily COVID hospitalization rates may exceed the prior peak. So testing and infection rates might vary around for all kinds of reasons, but people ending up in hospital, that is hard to ignore. Uh, the Bank of England then, if they don't hike today because there is no meeting and because of Omicron, what does that do to the longer term? Does that really well, mean they hike in February? Or there, are there just too many unknowns? Anna, I can, I can at least lighten it up a little by saying Merry Christmas to you. Today Thank you is very my much. Last day until Happy after holidays. The holidays. Happy holidays to Matt as he disappears off to celebrate. I'll be here tomorrow. This is Bloomberg.